Am I live? Super. If anyone out there could say they can hear me, that would be awesome. Can you hear me? Introducing um, Sleevy. Sleevy's a corn snake. Very friendly. Don't worry. Connie Evans, you have started out with a great question. Um, I'm going to go back to that at the end, I think, because hopefully during the course of my talk, um, some things to do with that question will become clearer. Um, it's still not quite five, so I'm going to wait for one minute before actually getting going. Emily D, thank you. I'm glad you can hear. Um, what's everyone been doing anyway? I've had three naps today. This quarantine thing is, is killing me. It's a t-shirt. It's a t-shirt. A t-shirt's a type of shirt. Okay, it's five o'clock. So let me introduce myself to anyone who doesn't already know me. I'm Harry and I'm a, I'm a venomologist. Um, but I've, <laughs> I've come quite, thank you very much, Lizzie Daly. T-shirt has approval from the boss, Tim. So um, I'm a venomologist and um, my passion for venom started at a very young age um, when I, I first got my um, pet snake, which was actually this one and another one. The other one sadly died, um, but here's his head. Um, and sadly, my parents never let me have pet cobras or puff adders. Um, that was my, my ultimate dream. Um, but I started out science doing a, a bachelor's in zoology at Cardiff University. And I then went on to do a master's at Exeter before doing a PhD studying venoms and particularly looking at snake bites and ways of improving snake, um, the, the treatment and diagnosis of snake bites at Reading. Um, so the things that really triggered my love of uh, snake bites and, um, and venoms was probably first in 2013 when I spent a year in Peru and I had this incredible mentor who was, um, he was an American called Brian, Brian Canarana, and he had this crazy, he would basically, he wouldn't catch any deadly snakes, but all of the sort of mildly venomous snakes that are, that are still, you know, somewhat dangerous, um, he'd still catch but never pin them. So like never grab them by the back of the head like this because he didn't want to hurt them. So instead he'd just catch them and then frequently they'd just come and bite us. And so um, we were basically on a daily basis seeing the effects of these very mild venoms. Um, so what happens is you get sort of some like raised lumps. Sometimes you get a little rash. Sometimes you get a headache, um, but it's nothing too severe. Um, so after a year of doing that, I felt pretty confident and I, I had this, um, this serious love of snakes. Fast forward two years, and I started working on this film called The Elephant Queen. Um, it's on um, Apple TV Plus, so if you haven't, haven't already seen it, go and watch it. Um, but there in our filming camp, we, had, uh, we were inundated with snakes every day. Um, we had cobras, we had burrowing asps, um, and we had puff adders, um, basically everything you can imagine. Um, in Africa anyway, and I was catching them every day and it was it was like a dream come true, really. Um, but then one day we were all sat around the campfire in the evening um, and the director said, Harry, you've got to stop catching snakes. Um, if you get bitten by one, it'll be a medical emergency. We'll have to fly you to the nearest hospital and they might may not have antivenom. And then if you die, that's not going to look very good on us. Um, so I was pretty upset about this. So I started researching and I was like, I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to tell them why they should let me catch snakes. Um, but very quickly, I realized that um, in the West, we're sort of sheltered from the reality of snake bite, which is that 150,000 people are dying every year from snake bites and a similar number are, are losing limbs and getting permanent disabilities from, from snake bites. And so that sort of made me think, oh God, I'm so privileged, I, I really should do something about this. So that's what really started me on my PhD, looking at snake bites and venoms. So um, before we get into the, the fun stuff and the, the sheer diversity of venoms in, in the animal kingdom, I want to make a couple of things clear. So venoms are injected, poisons are ingested. So if something bites you and you die, it's a venom. If you eat something and it affects you, um, then it's a poison, yeah? 
Um, so venoms are made up of, of um, proteins and peptides, and they don't really look anything like this. But proteins are much bigger and they're much more complicated. They've got all these tangles and stuff in them. And peptides are much simpler. And these things basically work by, I've even got a fake cell somewhere. Where is it? Anyway, they basically work by either um, binding onto the cell. In the case of peptides, they just bind onto cells and stop the cell functioning properly. The proteins, which are mostly enzymes, work um, slightly differently and they just destroy the, sh destroy the cell. So the things that peptides are just binding to, they typically actually go in and completely destroy. And the peptides, they can also sort of like break open cells and do all these sorts of things. But essentially these things, proteins and peptides, are pretty big. And if we eat them, they're not actually dangerous. They'll just be digested like any other, um, any other protein we're eating, unless you have, say, a cut in your mouth or something, and then it would be quite problematic. But just to make matters slightly more confusing, you do get some animals. Let's pretend this is a newt. I think it's got scales, so it's probably some sort of lizard. But there are certain newts out there um, that, as well as being poisonous, so they have glands in their skin that secrete um, poisonous substances, they also have um, sort of little ribs that they are allowed, to, they can push out and inject venom that way. You also get frogs, certain frogs, so um, Greening's frog, for example, which have the same, um, the, the poisonous skin, so they're inedible, but as well as that, they also have spines on their head, which mean they're venomous. And then we also get snakes that are venomous, um, things like keelbacks, that eat things like poisonous newts and are themselves poisonous and venomous. Okay, um, slightly confusing, I know, um, but there we have it. Okay, so moving on, so probably, Venoms have evolved for three main reasons. Sorry, I've lost the snake. Um, the major reason is for predation. And the main predators are obviously um, snakes. Um, there are about 600 species of venomous snakes and um, their venoms are highly complex. Um, but they basically can be categorized into um, the vipers, which are things like rattlesnakes. Um, rattlesnakes, puff adders, anything that says adder in the in the title, apart from death adders, is a viper. Um, and then we have the elapids, which are things like cobras, crates, and mambas. And um, vipers have these fangs that are hinged, um, so they're able to sort of flick out. They're very long, and it means they can get very deep inside their prey, which is important because their venoms mostly affect the internal organs and blood. So they need their venom to get deep inside their prey whereas the lapids have much shorter fangs, and their venoms are mostly neurotoxic, so they basically work by paralyzing the animal and preventing the animal from being able to breathe. Um, so what this means is that these venomous snakes, um, so for example, Sleevey, if Sleevey's feeding, yeah, it'll find a mouse and then immediately have to wrap it up in coils of, uh, of its body to stop it biting him and attacking him so that he can kill the prey as quickly as possible. With these venomous snakes instead, they can bite their prey and then it's absolutely fine for them to let go of the prey. They know the prey is gonna die very quickly so they can just let the prey run off. They risk no um, danger to themselves and then they can use their forked tongue to go and hunt down the prey and, and gobble it up. So as well as snakes, we obviously have everyone's favorite, which are the arachnids. So arachnids, you know, like every, the big ones are sort of like tarantulas, um, like this and also big scorpions like this yeah and they inject their venom in completely different ways so with tarantulas we have these things called chelicerae at the front which are basically fangs um, they're hollow um, and they inject normally pretty boring venoms in tarantulas but in things like black widows and stuff they have incredibly potent venoms um, which can be dangerous to humans they also frequently have at least tarantulas do, have these hairs on their back. The hairs on their back are not venomous. Lots of people think they are venomous because they do cause quite a serious rash, but they're not actually venomous. So then moving on to scorpions. Scorpion stings, found in the tail, yeah? And they're fed by this thing just below it called the telson. And below the telson is the anus. The anus is where they poo. 
Sorry, I've had an interruption. Oh, you want to take the snack? Don't worry, we'll find it at the end. Um, the te um, just below the telson, anus. Anus is where they poo. And what this means is that a scorpion is quite capable of stinging you and pooing, you, pooing on you at the same time, which just adds insult to injury. Something very similar to a scorpion, it's actually called a pseudo-scorpion, um, is quite... So the only difference, really, it looks very similar to this, apart from it doesn't have a tail. And these guys inject their venom instead through their petty palps, which are actually the claws. So by um, pinching you, they're actually also able to inject the venom. So tailless, but lovely petty palps with poison. Um, venom glands just behind um, these little fang-like protrusions on the end of their claws. So centipedes. Centipedes. People often say they got stung or they got bitten by a centipede. Um, well, the reality is that um, they don't have fangs. What they have is these things called forcipules. I've done another lovely drawing here. And forcipules are modified legs. They're actually legs. So if you're bitten by a centipede, it's actually more of a kick than anything else. Um, and they have, they have venoms that have really evolved to just take down prey. Um, but that said, they're still very painful for humans. So there is a slightly defensive aspect. Um, to their venom. Right, so probably one of my favorite venomous predators is um, the cone snail. And this is actually just a ball of white tack, but this is about how big a cone snail is. They're a mollusk that are basically found in all the tropical waters of the world and they have incredibly potent venoms. And they basically have um, like a small harpoon which they're able to shoot out and into their fish prey. And then um, it means they can pull in the fish and frequently they, they'll eat the fish whole afterwards. So not too dissimilar um, from snakes. And this is not entirely dissimilar to the um, harpoon-like structures that jellyfish have, which are called, which is like a trigger. And anything that brushes this will call the nematocyst, which is inside it, to push out and squeeze lots of venom into, into prey primarily. But again, if you're unlucky enough to, um, to be swimming and knock into a jellyfish, um, just defensively, they will also do this. It's just out of fear normally. Although I'm not really sure if jellyfish can feel fear per se. Anyway, moving on. So now onto the strictly defensive venoms. Like the everyday culprits of these defensive venoms are things like wasps. Yeah, this was dead by my window not so long ago. And, and bees and the venom delivery system in these is actually, um, it's the ovipositor. So the thing that originally they were maybe using to lay eggs now delivers venom. But I think they're pretty boring examples um, of defensive venoms because when we really look into it, um, it gets slightly confusing, um, but a whole range of uh, less common animals use venom. So probably everyone's favorite example, me lorises. So lorises, which are these small, very small, cute primates, and you frequently see them on social media, and they'll normally be doing this. And everyone thinks this is all cute It's because they're ticklish and that's why they, they do it. But that's that's actually not not the, not the truth at all. So on, on lorises, I've drawn it here, but basically just here, they have this thing called the brachial gland. And when they're doing this, um, this brachial gland is much like sweat glands in your armpit or whatever. It's, it's producing a lot of substances. And these substances are actually toxic. Um, so by having the brachial glands right by their face, they're able to lick the brachial gland, fill their mouth with all these toxins. And then that means that anything, wow. any predators in the wild, that would be eagles and snakes and such like. But more commonly, it's just as a household pet. Um, they, they, I think they find their owners as a, as a predation risk. And they do this so that they can lick, lick um, and fill their mouth with toxins. And then they're, they're primed and ready to bite you with actually a, what is it considered a venomous bite. The other um, venomous mammals also do it defensively. So we have platypuses, which are arguably the weirdest of all the creatures on the planet, um, you know, with their duck bills and also their venomous hind claw. So in the back of their, in their foot, the males have a venomous spur, which they use um, to defend um, females against other males so they can keep them off themselves and stuff. We also have some more dubious, like questionable um, examples of venoms being seen in hedgehogs. Um, so hedgehogs are, are one of the animals that are able to um, eat toads, which have these things called bufotoxins in their skin. And there are actually, um, there are reported cases of basically hedgehogs will catch a toad, lick its back and get these bufotoxins on its tongue and then cover the spines in these bufotoxins, which then makes their spines actually um, somewhat venomous, which is quite interesting. And then basically all the fish, there are um, about 1,200 species of venomous fish, 
and we've got the puffer fish. We've got several species of venomous sharks. Um, oh, yep, yeah, puffer fish here. Several species of venomous sharks. Um, weaver fish. We've got all the scorpion fish, and they all have these. Normally, one spine. Lionfish have about 17, I think, but all the spines are connected to venom glands and so are able to deliver venom. Um, to any potential predators and very quickly predators learn what to eat these things and, and they're quite well protected from that. So some of the less common causes of the evolution of venom in animals is, um, so for example, parasitism. So things like mosquitoes, um, ticks and lice, um, certain, um, even sand flies to some extent and vampire bats. They're all hematophagus, so they're all, um, they're all, they all feed mainly on blood. And in order to bite an animal and then get free flowing blood, they basically inject a pretty rudimentary venom, um, which means that the blood doesn't clot and they can drink for as long as they want. Leeches are another example um, until they're full and then they can just drop off. And then we also get um, these things which I'm calling hoarding venoms. I'm not sure they have an official name, but hoarding venoms are basically, um, they're venoms that allow animals to eat later. Um, and so, Cool examples are things like shrews, um, shrews and moles. Um, so basically their diets consist mainly of things like earthworms and other invertebrates. So they take, um, they take these and then they'll bite them with a, with a venom that paralyzes them. Then that means that they can take them back into their hole, leave them at the back of the hole, and then whenever they're hungry, like sort of um, go back and, and eat, um, which is kind of cool. But also if you think about it like humans, that's a bit like paralyzing a cow and keeping it in your larder and then, um, when you're hungry, just cutting off a steak and frying it up. So it's maybe a little bit sick as well. And then you also get um, similar venoms, but they're actually used for their, for their children. And this is, this is found in parasitized wasps, which are, they look quite similar to our the wa everyday wasps we have here. They have thinner waists and much longer ovipositors. Um, and they typically find things like caterpillars, um, which they inject with a venom, which will paralyze them. And then they lay eggs either inside them or on them so that when the egg hatches, they can just sit there and gorge for as long as they want, um, which would be quite a nice start to life, I'd imagine. Um, so next, I'm, I'm going to go on to why humans are using venom. So obviously, um, as you've just seen, the diversity of animals that use venoms is, is massive. We have, um, there's about 2,400 species of scorpions that are all venomous. Um, nearly 4,000 species of pseudoscorpions, all venomous, 8,000 species of centipedes, um, about 50,000 species of spiders, God knows how many insects um, that have venom. And in each of these venoms, there's about, varies between three to say 50 different compounds. And all of these have potential use in medicine. Um, and so far we already have drugs that are used in, um, in America, um, mostly. Um, for things like pain, diabetes, um, early stages of drugs that are treating are going to be treating cancer and a lot of antimicrobial peptides. Um, so these are the small peptides, but they're able to kill things like viruses, bacteria, um, fungi, um, you name it. How much time do I actually have left? OK, 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 seriously running out of time. So I'm going to speed up very quickly and start trying to answer some of these questions because I would like to keep it. Um... <laughs> yes, Emily D. Okay, newts push out their ribs. Not all newts, only certain species of ribs, uh, of, ribs of, of newts are able to do this. And yeah, they basically have to break their ribs, but it means that the, the ribs penetrate the skin and they come out and they inject, um, inject a venom as they do it. How can you tell if a snake is agitated from its behavior? Well, it depends on the snake. A lot of snakes, like rattlesnakes, they've evolved to have a rattle, so they can shake their rattle, and then you'll know, you'll know one that it's there. And by the sound of that rattle, it's so ominous. I think um, even pe people and things that haven't come across rattlesnakes before know not to go near there. Um, and most other snakes, they don't have a rattle. They'll use their sort of tail between um, between leaf litter and like flick it together like that, and it sort of sounds like a rattle. There are other snakes that um, push their scales against each other to make a fairly similar noise. Um, where's the best place to see snakes in the UK? Um, I'm not the best person to ask because I've barely ever seen any snakes in the UK. Um, I mean, yeah, Heathland is supposed to be very good for adders. Adders are 
for doing really badly in this country. Um, grass snakes, obviously, they prefer grassland, but also wet, marshy areas. Um, yeah, good luck finding snakes in the UK. In fact, if you find any, please let me know. Are many venoms collected for medical reasons? So yeah, um, that's one, one of the big things that I've been doing in, in my research in the past is just screening huge numbers of venoms from a variety of different animals in order to see if they have any potential as, as drugs. Um, yeah. So snakes will flatten their head too. He, um, they don't really flatten their heads per se. So obviously all the cobras will flatten, um, flatten their heads this way. Um, you also get um, snakes like boomslangs that flatten it the other way. Um, and they do just make themselves look bigger and a little bit scarier. Um, but it's not, it's not found in all snakes at all. Um, but it is at least one of the ways they can, they can show potential predators or... Um... Hi, Phil. Hey, nice fans. Hi, Steve. Um, it would be really helpful to be like um, Joe Wick, actually. Just be able to be like, hey, Nikki, shout out. But um, you can't have everything. What work are we doing to improve antivenom therapy? So antivenom availability. So, I mean, most of the research going into antivenom at the moment is actually trying to move away from antivenoms because antivenoms are proteins, they degrade, and they're basically not the best medicine for the people who most need them, which are people out in fields, um, people far away from hospitals. So what we're um, working on in, in the snake bite community is all trying to get something that's similar to an aspirin or, or you know, a pill, basically, um, that, that can be used as a first line of defense. So after somebody's bitten by a snake, they'll hopefully just be able to take a pill and that will at least um, give them enough time to get to a hospital. Um, which snakes? OK, yes. Sorry. Which snake has the most poisonous venom in the world? It's 22 minutes. I feel like I am going over time, but I really want to answer this. Um, so. I, obviously I don't like the poisonous venom thing because it's venom or poison, but so the most venomous snake in the world. So we, we typically do this by injecting mice with a venom. Um, but this doesn't always make sense because a lot of snakes venoms have evolved to take down reptiles and amphibians. Um, so if you're testing their venoms out on, on mice, then it's not a true representative of, of um, the actual potency of that venom. It just shows how good they are against mice. But by this mouse index, then the Australian snake, the inland taipan, is the, is the most venomous snake in the world. But very few deaths happen from this snake. So I would say the most dangerous snake in the world is, is the Russell's viper because it kills, it kills probably about 30,000 people a year. It has the best of both the elapids and the vipers. It, it will um, send people into paralysis, but it will also completely shut down their internal organs and their blood system. Um, and there's loads of them, and they love to hang out in all the all the fields and stuff where people are collecting crops um, and that sort of thing. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Tiger snakes, tiger snakes are bad. Yeah, tiger snakes are really bad. They don't they don't really make it to that top spot though um, by the LD50, which is the, the lethal dose that will kill 50% of the mice. So it's um, they're, they're somewhat lower down from from the inland taipan. Um, it's been really nice doing this. It's really strange not being able to see people yawn. Um, hopefully you all stuck around and you didn't just go and turn this on and, and then wander off to make tea. Um, but it's been a pleasure. Um, hopefully if you have any more questions or if you want to just talk to me about venoms or getting into the venom field, my email address is at the bottom or you can follow me on Instagram at hasfw and um, I'm really happy to talk about it. I could talk about it all day long. Um, thanks to Lizzie for having me. And guys, remember that there are more live lessons every day. Um, she's doing an incredible job. I, I can't believe she's actually done it. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye.